Okay. Now, the one tricky thing um, that really differs between the microscopes is the business of calibrating image pixel sizes and rotations. Now, ultimately, for all those things that uh, we're, we've been showing you how to use the program, the tasks, the tilt series, the mapping, the program needs to know both the pixel size and the rotation angle of images on the camera for every mag that's going to get used. Um, but one nice thing is that if there are image shift calibrations at two magnifications, um, and a pixel size and rotation for only one of those, it can derive pixel size or rotation for another mag from the one that has the values using the image shift calibrations. Now that's a, a good thing if image shift really is something that's invariant and independent of the magnification. And on FEI scopes, it fits that assumption very nicely. Um, so the image shift happens up at the specimen and it's independent of the in magnification rotations that are imposed by the projector system. And so you can actually function with a good set of image shift calibrations and just one pixel size and, and rotation angle uh, for each mag range, where mag range here means non-low mag, and low mag, and, and, and low mag. So, um, but of course, you probably want to have more pixel sizes than that calibrated because this is what's going into the headers of your image files. This is, this is the information about your data. And it's easy to find pixel sizes uh, with the standard waffle grading and using the pixel size routine in the process menu down to a field of view of about one to one and a half microns. As long as you still have at least two blocks in each direction of, of the waffle grading, it can actually find the peaks uh, and estimate the pixel size. Now, with JUL scopes, and the is going to go into detail on this tomorrow, I think, a bit, um, the image shift is not as independent of the magnification. And what we found that we need is that we need to have a complete set of measurements of pixel sizes and rotations uh, between the mags um, to avoid having to rely on this transfer of information from one mag to another through the image shift calibrations. So, um, question that's on many people's minds is what calibrations need to be doing and when. And I don't have tremendous ability to answer this because I only live with one set of microscopes here all the time and know what goes on with them. But there are some calibrations that go out of date very easily. And as I mentioned earlier, the crossover calibration on the FEI goes out after some unknown scope realignments. Um, and this can make the beam intensities bad, calibrations bad, you can, especially if you fall onto the wrong side of crossover. And um, But the way it's set up now, all you have to do is redo the crossover calibrations, and it shifts everything, or it keeps track of what they are. Um, and so that, uh, and it shifts the, the calibrations so that they're valid again. And this seems to be successful. Um, the tilt axis offset, if you enter it in the property file, goes out of date every time the stage gets touched by service. Well, maybe not that bad, but probably. Um, and if they're good, they will adjust it to be within one micron all the time, and it won't matter. But the fact is that they don't, and um, unless you insist on them adjusting it when it gets to a certain point, you'll come up with sort of a random different value at various times. Um, on JUL, there are neutral values, so-called, for the image shift. Um, and if those get redone on the microscope, then Serial EM needs to know what they are, too. And this is critical for keeping area centered when you're changing mags. But so you need to know when this has happened and run the cal rate image shift neutral value routine to record the new values into the calibration file. Now, the image shift offsets that I talked about um, do go bad after service alignments that align the mags um, because They've just gone and done it a little bit differently this time than the previous time. And they seem to just sort of change a little over time. So those need a little more constant attention. And um, those are a bit tricky because you have to find a feature that is um, uh, something you can recognize over the very wide range of mags that you want to track through this calibration from, say, 
fifty thousand down to a hundred thousand, not not hundred thousand, down to a hundred x or you know two hundred x or so. And um, I've found that the corner of a section works well, or the corner of a rip in the, in the film, as long as it's stable. Um, uh, so some, some kind of sharp corner. Sometimes you could maybe use a piece of conta ice contamination as long as it's something you can center on well enough at the high mag and still see at the low mags. So if you've got a feature, then it's kind of a fun calibration because it's like a little video game where you take a picture and you center it up with the, with the mouse and you push the button and it goes and drops the mag and takes another picture for you to center up. Um, so then there's some calibrations that are more stable, but they may need attention after major realignments. Um, I think the mag energy offsets could change, although we haven't really seen cases where that happens. It's sort of a good thing if there's been a major realignment to, to go and do those. The image shift calibrations could probably change pretty easily because they, on the, on the FEI machines, there's, a, there's an alignment that go, you go through where you actually uh, calibrate the relationship between image shift coils and the amount of movement of the image shift. And so if that isn't done right or a little differently, that could change the calibrations. But again, this is a global thing. So all you have to do is redo them at one mag, and you're given an option to change all the calibrations you've got by the same amount. And you can do that and save them out. And it usually takes care of it. The beam shift calibration could probably go out. Um, if you see that the move beam or center beam functions need to be repeated, or on a JOL, if um, when you do an image shift, the beam gets off-centered, that probably means the beam shift calibration is not that good. Because on JOL, the program has to independently sh shift the beam and the image using this beam shift calibration. So it is critical there. Uh, the focus calibration, well, I tend to think that's sort of a hard-coded thing, as long as you've got the same uh, alignments. But um, as people have brought up more reasons why it might be bad, maybe it is something you need to pay more attention to, and maybe people do even need to do their own calibrations. But it, it's something I think that is probably an individual situation that, that is, it involves that. So, um, so then, what are the calibrations that users need to worry about, or need to actually do? Well, there's very few of those because the model is that you've got an administrator, one person who takes care of updating the shared calibrations. This is only going to work if you have um, sufficiently similar and good scope alignments. Um, so, I think that at least on the FEI approach, you have a, what we do in our lab is we have periodically a service, a service saves an alignment, or sometimes send your eye, we'll go and touch that up and save that. And then we say, this is the alignment, you should load this. And people do that. And then they do their daily tuning. And we're all in a very similar state there. And things, so things work very well. Now, electron dose, of course, you've got to do that. Um, because the beam strength will vary um, over the course of hours, I guess, but certainly from day to day. And it does get out calibrated automatically with the game reference, but as I mentioned this morning, um, once you get to a spot size that's far away from that, you're, you're kind, of, kind of an indirect chain of, of inferences that are involved in estimating the dose there, and so it's a good idea to do a direct calibration at your working spot size for low dose. The um, montaging routine, as you saw in one of the videos, always asks you to calibrate the image shift. And I'm not sure this is really needed, but it, it definitely used to be needed when montaging was first made up on the ancient microscopes. Um, and it may be the case more on JUL than FEI scopes, but um, it can't hurt you. It's a quick, it's a quick procedure. And as I mentioned, um, some people seem to do focus calibrations frequently, and it's not something I would have thought you needed to do. I and mean, it's better to do it with at least a stable specimen instead of the spe specimen you're trying to work with if it's not that stable. 
Um, that's definitely the case. Um, but again, this is something I probably I need to know more about why people do want to redo their focus calibrations. Um, Cindy said people were always interested in these other issues about um, corrections that are available in IMOD and that do involve some use of serial EM. So I've summarized them here with the, with the source for the, the manuals. Um, so there's two kinds of corrections that I worked out for image distortions in IMOD. One is called image distortion fields, where this is like basically a set of vectors that show how the image has been moved around at various places in the field. And this is primarily needed when using an energy filter, particularly the GIF. Um, not sure how much it's needed with omega filters. Um, and the other this correction is for magnification gradients in tilted images when they're taken with non-parallel illumination. And um, the programs for this have been around for quite a while and they're fully documented. But the overall instructions are something I haven't gotten around to getting into IMOD. And so you just have to write to me and ask for those at this point. Although I swear I'm going to get that in there this, in this cycle. Um, so for the image distortion field, what happens in serial EM is you take distortion pairs. There's something just eight pair, four pairs of images. And there's a routine in the calibration menu for that. And optionally, you take little tilt series of about seven pictures. And all that gets analyzed with these two programs called Find Distort and Match Rot Pairs. For the magnification gradients, uh, it involves taking uh, montages of the three by two, or three by two montages. Using just the waffle grading is fine, something stable at, at high tilt. And um, those get analyzed with these two other programs, Find Gradient, and then the table gets made with the Make Grad Table. Um, the CTF determination that's done with CTF file requires a series of blank images, and that uh, is the procedure for getting those is fully described in that man page. And then we've also found that correcting for at least the attenuation of high frequencies by, by the CCD camera, which is the MTF or modulation transfer function, what you do is filter by the inverse of this. This is very useful with sub-volume averages, where the data are nice and clean, but you've lost high-resolution detail just because it was, it was attenuated, and you could boost that up uh, partially and bring it back. So that kind of measurement of the MTF requires an image, edge image that you take in the microscope, and then you analyze it with this program, Edge MTF. And that's it for correction.